The National Gallery catalogue is for art experts. The entry on this painting is about 14 pages long, densely written. They are about who commissioned the painting, Legal swatches, who owned it, its likely date, the pedigree of its owners. Behind this information lie years of research. What for? To prove beyond any shadow of doubt that it is a genuine Leonardo. And to prove that an almost identical painting in the Louvre is in fact a <laughs> French art historians <laughs> try to prove the opposite. <laughs> For this drawing by Leonardo, the Americans wanted to pay two and a half million pounds. Now, it hangs in a room by itself behind bulletproof perspex. The lights are kept low so as to prevent the drawing from fading. But why is it so important to preserve and display this like a chapel? It's acquired a kind of new impressiveness, but not because of what it shows, not because of the meaning of its image. It's become mysterious again, but not because of what it shows, not because of the meaning of its image. It's become mysterious again, but not because of what it shows, not because of the meaning of its image. It's become mysterious it's more as possible. when the camera made them reproducible. And now it is here like a relic in a holy shrine. A lot more. Is this possible. religiosity, usually linked with cash value, but always invoked in the name of culture and civilization, a certain sense of awe. A lot because more is possible. They have survived because they're genuine, because they are absurdly valuable. A lot more is possible. And this market value depends upon it being genuine. A lot more is possible. But only if art is stripped of the false mystery and the false religiosity which surrounds it. I don't want to suggest that there is nothing left to experience before original works of art, except because of its market value, is in fact a substitute for what paintings lost when the camera made them reproducible. Occasionally, this uninterrupted silence and the stillness of a painting can be very striking. I can't demonstrate the stillness, for the lines on your screen are never still. And in a sense, the pages of a book are never still. The most important thing about paintings themselves is that their images are silent, still. To do with what anybody teaches about art. It's as if the painting, absolutely still, soundless, becomes a corridor connecting the moment it represents with the moment at which you are looking at it. And something travels down that corridor at a speed greater than light, throwing into question our way of measuring time itself. Because paintings are silent and still, and because their meaning is no longer attached to them, but has become transmittable, paintings lend themselves to easy manipulation. They can be used to make arguments or points which may be different, very different, from their original meaning. And because paintings are essentially silent and still, the most obvious way of manipulating them is by using movement and sound. The camera moves in to remove a detail of a painting from the whole from being part of a strange poetical world of metamorphosis. A dog can be turned into a pet, not unlike the dog of his master's voice. The meaning of a painting shown on film or television can be changed even more radically. If you look at the whole painting, Bruegel's intention is fairly clear. The of a cross is in the middle distance, carried forward by the crowd, which is making its way to the place of the crew, far away on the right, where a circle of onlookers has already gathered. Its meaning changes. An allegorical figure becomes a pretty girl anywhere. If you look at the whole picture, you see that it is about grief, about torture, and above all about the callousness, the eager inquisitiveness, the superstitious drive of the crowd. If it sets out to be a religious painting, it is an oddly secular one. But the difficulty is that on a screen, if you keep the whole painting in view, you don't see very much. You have been waiting impatiently for the camera to go in to examine details. With a different camera movement again, it can be shown as an example of landscape painting. Yet, as soon as this happens, the comprehensive effect of the painting can be changed. 
For example, it is possible to isolate and show the details in a way that makes the painting look like a fairly straightforward devotional picture. Or details can present it to you in terms of the history of costume or social customs. Most easily, it can be presented as a story. In a film sequence, the details have to be selected and rearranged into a narrative which depends on unfolding Yet, In the time. painting as a whole, all these elements are there simultaneously. In paintings, there is no unfolding time. As well as by the movements of the camera, paintings are modified and changed by the sounds you hear when looking at them. Here is a landscape. Look at it for a moment in silence. Now supposing I say whilst you look, this is the last picture Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. The camera, by making the work of art transmittable, has multiplied its possible meanings and destroyed its unique original meaning. Have works of art gained anything by this? They have lost and gained. Let me try to explain how. Words you notice consciously. Music is subtler. It can work almost without your noticing it. How often do you consciously notice the music played over paintings on television? Here are details of this painting. Each Touch time, music, the impact of the Goya is modified. <laughs> Yet music and rhythm change the significance of a picture. Now cut to a religious chorale. I've now emphasized the ways in which reproduction makes the meaning of works of art ambiguous. This is not as negative as it necessarily sounds, if we realize what is happening. What it means, in theory, is that reproduction of works of art can be used by anybody for their own purposes. Images can be used like words, we can talk with them. Reproduction should make it easier to connect our experience of art directly with other experiences. You can sometimes see how naturally this begins to happen when, for instance, children or adults pin up reproductions alongside snapshots or their own drawings or pages from magazines. There, everything belongs to the same visual language used for describing or recreating experience. What so often inhibits such a spontaneous process is the false mystification which surrounds art. For instance, the art book depends upon reproductions. Yet often, what the reproductions make accessible, a text begins to make inaccessible. What might become part of our language is jealously guarded and kept within the narrow preserves of the art expert. But I can demonstrate the silence. <laughs> 